Hello, and welcome to the Lifecycle Institute's webinar on simulations, thinking outside the box to build capabilities. I'm Tara Denton, and I'll be your host for today's session. I'm a learning consultant with the Lifecycle Institute, so we'll be in this webinar for about 30 or so minutes. Earlier today, we emailed you with a worksheet that we're going to be using during the session. If you didn't have a chance, to download that worksheet, or uh, if you didn't have a chance to print it out, I would like to go ahead and transfer that file to you now so that you may print it out really quickly and um, fill it out during the activity that we'll have in this session. I'm going to leave that file transfer up for a little while as people continue to join the session. So after you download the worksheet, just go ahead and minimize that box in the upper right-hand corner so it won't disturb your view of the screen. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about simulations. And we're going to start out with defining discovery learning and experiential learning, because that's really the umbrella that learning simulations fall underneath. So that's going to be our first learning objective for today's session. Our second objective is to actually talk about simulations themselves to define what is a learning simulation. We're going to list some characteristics of a good simulation, and that's where that worksheet will come into play. Then we're going to talk about some examples of simulations that can be done in the classroom or can be done online. And we'll review some tips so that you can successfully execute a simulation. Hopefully at the end of the session, you all will have a good idea about what simulations are, what kind of opportunities you can look at to use a simulation in your environment, and how to successfully uh, facilitate a uh, learning simulation. So I'd like to start off with some interaction. Let's open up a poll. I'd like to know how many people in the session today have ever participated in a learning simulation. Then if you have participated in a learning simulation, I'd like to know if that experience, if the simulation and, and, and going through the step-by-step -step simulations motivated you to change the way that you did things when you returned back to the office. I think we have a, um, a little problem with the poll. If you were able to answer, thank you very much for answering. I think a few people might have gotten cut off. But we still have the results, so I want to see what the majority of you put in. It looks like over half of you have participated in the simulation, and that um, many of you said that the simulation experience did change the way that you did things. For those of you who feel that a simulation was effective and, and changed your behavior to produce a result, I'd like for you to share what you think about that simulation made it so successful. What do you feel made the simulation effective? Was it the facilitator that helped you along? Was it the the actual simulation itself? Did it make you uh, consider different alternatives that you hadn't considered previously to, exper to um, participating in the simulation? And if you'll just chat a few of those responses to me in the chat box and send it to all participants, which is the last option that you have at the bottom of the drop-down box, I would really like to know your opinions on what made the simulation successful. Okay, Lynn, she says it's, it's like real life. That is actually one of the qualifications that we'll talk about later on in the, in the session about what makes a good quality simulation. Well, let's go ahead then, and as you're thinking about what you felt made the simulation effective, Ed says it directly applied to, uh, directly applied to business processes. Yes, that's, that's, a, that's another quality um, or qualifier of a, of a good simulation. So as you're continuing to think about that and go ahead and keep sending the chats in, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about discovery learning. And a simulation is the epitome of discovery learning. Well, what is discovery learning? Discovery learning or experiential learning is learning by doing, by experimenting, questioning. It's problem solving, using prior knowledge and a, and a coach or a facilitator as your guide through the experience. 
And discovery learning is all about making new connections and constructing new ideas. Now, how a simulation fits in is the actual definition of a simulation is the imitation of a real thing or process, just like Ed said, directly applied to business processes. With a simulation, you can experience behavior and experiment new behaviors in realistic condition. And my favorite definition of a simulation is that they are designed make-believe. They're make-believe for a purpose. So let's talk about the different kinds of simulations that we run into. We basically run into two different kinds of simulation. We have the classroom simulations where, like Anita said, you get feedback from other participants while you, you are in the experience. And then there is an online uh, simulation where you are interacting in an, in an online environment. So in a classroom simulation, you could have board games that have decision points. Uh, another type of simulation would be an episodic storyline or a scenario where you have different uh, points or spaces in which you need to make decisions. Or you could have a process simulation, like Ed mentioned earlier, or a building, some kind of a building project simulation. And those are primarily the simulations that we find uh, in the classroom environment. On the online, we have about five main types of, of simulations. The first one, which is one of the more intensive simulations, is called practice, where that's where you have your airplane simulations, your uh, potential conflict simulations. We have the interactive diagrams, which is where the entire screen becomes a diagram of concepts. For example, if you can uh, imagine a, um, an interactive diagram where you learn the different um, processes that Congress has to go through or the different areas of, of Congress. Um, branching stories, like an episodic storyline, which is very similar to the episodic storyline that we would have in a classroom simulation, or an interactive spreadsheets. Now, these aren't your Excel spreadsheets. The business schools like to use interactive spreadsheets a lot. You can discover issues like um, resource management between certain projects and, and the impact of managing different resources in different ways. Or, for example, if you wanted to start a business or uh, a um, nonprofit business, you could you could explore time management uh, trade-offs between fundraising and uh, maybe different product development times. Um, then the last, uh, the fifth of, of the um, main types of online simulations is virtual labs and products. And those can be used for like um, learning how to repair a machine. And we'll see an example of a virtual product here later on in the session. So what makes a good simulation? Well, if you take out that worksheet that was emailed to you before the session or that you just downloaded, um, we're going to step through this together and fill in the four characteristics of a quality simulation. And these characteristics are true of a great simulation, whether it be computer-based or a live classroom-based simulation experience. The first characteristic of a good simulation is that it should be relevant. And we already had that mentioned earlier through one of our chats. Why did that person change their behavior after they experienced the simulation? Because it was relevant to their real life situation. They felt confident experimenting with those behaviors in real life. The second characteristic of a good objective, of a good uh, simulation, is that it focuses on objectives. Now, what this means is, Keep the simulation as simple as possible. Strip away any excess complexity and get to the point with your simulation. So first we have make it relevant, make it believable. Then we have focus on objectives, keep to the point. The third characteristic of a great simulation is that a simulation should allow choices that have outcomes, consequences to the decisions that you make during the simulation. The final or the fourth that we're going to talk about in this section, quality of a good simulation, is that you have before, during, and after facilitation of the simulation. Set the stage and coach, but don't give too many rules away. Let's talk now about a few types of 
simulation examples. We're going to start with some classroom simulation examples. I'll begin with the simulation that I wrote about in the Impact Newsletter, the Speed of Trust. And the Speed of Trust simulation is a board game simulation that's experienced in a group. The group assumes a character and they work through the simulation to deliver an important project and they have to deliver that project on time and within budget. Now during the simulation it recreates all aspects of life like work politics and family dynamics and team dynamics. And the purpose of this simulation is to realistically, again, back to one of our characteristics of a good simulation, realistically experience how trust and the speed of trust can directly affect time and cost. And we chose this type of classroom simulation because we wanted participants to be able to analyze, experience, and experiment with trust behaviors through these real-life scenarios. And no answer is right, but any well-meaning decision that is made through a simulation like this might even include a trust violation. So there was a lot of give and take um, in the simulation, and, and we wanted that um, real-life experimentation because we wanted the concept of trust to be transferred at a higher level of understanding, at the analyzing, experiencing, experimenting, versus a lower level of understanding, just remembering, um, repeating, or, or understanding the concept of trust. So we wanted people to be able to actually try some of those trust behaviors or experience what those trust behaviors would feel like. Another type of classroom simulation is a role play. Now this could be um, almost in the form of one of those episodic storylines that we discussed earlier. So let's take, for example, customer service um, training personnel. The new trainee, the new customer service representative, is given an open customer service case to investigate. So there's a customer role, and then there is a service representative role. And the role play begins because a facilitator will prompt the new um, service representative to choose how she wants to open the conversation with this customer. Depending on that opening, the customer will respond. Now, the response triggers that decision point. This is decision point number two in this, in this simulation for the customer service representative to respond. How do I respond to the customer's issue given his reaction to me? The simulation can continue with a prompt from the facilitator for resolution and conclusion and then a scoring metric can be applied at each decision point. And after the simulation, the trainee and the facilitator can discuss the different options that a customer service representative might have when dealing with customer issues. The last classroom simulation that we're going to talk about in this session is called a product game. This simulation is very fun, and we actually executed this recently uh, for a waste reduction um, game simulation. And the goal of the waste reduction simulation was to identify and reduce waste in a um, production process. So to make it fun and to make the simulation experience closer to reality, to integrate those two concepts of fun and reality, um, the facilitator decided to set up an assembly line process similar um, to the existing assembly line configuration that they had at the client site. Now during the simulation, the goal of the assembly line was to create a product to quality standards. Um, since it's still winter time and since I don't know about you guys, but down here in South Carolina, it is cold. We decided to create the process, uh, or the process, um, or the product would be a snowman that you create with, you know, different crafts. How we set up the simulation was a facilitator tried to mimic the assembly line as much as possible. And each person in the assembly line, you'll see these different stations, one to six. Each person in the assembly line was supposed to complete a stage in the snowman building process. The facilitator introduced different business constraints that the company was actually experiencing. They were experiencing quality issues. They had equipment reliability issues, customer demand issues, untrained employee issues, transportation issues. The list goes on. And each assembly line, there were multiple assembly lines. This was quite a large class worked together to make decisions that increase their efficiency and decrease the work production. So the group, at the, at the end of the simulation, the group convened to discuss the simulation experience together and brainstorm ways that they could improve their actual day-to-day -day process and reduce waste. 
Now I'm going to get into some online, some virtual um, computer-based simulations. And I'm going to share an application with you. This is an example of a virtual product. It's a small pulper, an interactive small pulper, where you can see when it comes up, just give it a second, when you can actually see the different elements of the machine. And I believe someone chatted in earlier that you can see the relationship between um, business elements in their process, and you can visualize it. Well, this um, computer-based simulation is really an excellent example of, of being able to really dig down and take a tour of different elements of a piece of equipment. Now, virtual products have kind of a, a brother in simulation, if you will. That brother is the interactive diagrams. And as you can see, the, the entire screen becomes a living, breathing machine. So you can work with the machine from inside out without having to worry about the machine's availability or, or any small parts or physical constraints that, that you would encounter with a real machine. So we'll go ahead and go back to the presentation, but I hope you guys thought that was fun because I like taking interactive tours like that. <laughs> Another example of a simulation, which is very close to, to the role play or the, or the episodic storyline simulation we discussed in classrooms, is a branching story. So earlier when we discussed the customer representative simulation, we can take that same role play and design a computer simulation that steps a customer service representative through a series of multiple choice based decisions on how to respond to the customer at the certain decision points. The outcome is dependent on the decisions made by the person that's playing the simulation. Now with regards to a classroom simulation that might have a manual metric or scoring metric, the online or the computer simulation is totally automatic and error free scoring. It's really easy. The com you can also choose during a computer simulation to give instant feedback on decisions made by the trainee or provide consolidated feedback at the end of the simulation. So we've talked about discovery learning, the type of learning that encompasses um, simulation. We gave a definition for the simulation as a constructed directed make-believe, a uh, few types of simulations, and some examples of classroom and online. So how can they be used? And I'd like to open that up to you. I would like to open it up to you so that you can have rights to write on the screen and you can Give me an example of a type of training where you might want to use a simulation as an example. So if you'll see at the top of your screen, you have a T icon. That'll allow you to type on the whiteboard. And I'd just like a couple of examples of different types of training environments where you might want to use a simulation. Equipment, train, equipment and driving. That's funny. I think that that's definitely two different people <laughs> who decided to write directly beside each other. And you can tell that because they're different colors. Um, and I agree with both of them. Machine balancing is another excellent way to where you don't actually have to use a, a real machine to practice those uh, processes on, but you can, you can use a, simula a simulated piece of equipment working in a hazardous environment, again, another way, and another way, too, where decision points are going to become very important. Communication, that's an interesting one. Um, people can practice communicating in a safe environment, and they can practice different modes of communication. Um, performance coaching, that's another great one, too, for new leaders, where you can experiment with different ways to react or and to um, develop the individual's um, who you work for and with. Training, yep. 
There you go. It's an excellent way to use simulations. Pump rebuilding. That one's a little lighter because um, it's in yellow, So, but I can still see it. And that would be a great way to try different, try to see how, how the different pieces of the machine relate to each other. And supply chain management, that's one where the interactive spreadsheets are really helpful. Cooking, that's interesting. I think you're absolutely right. I haven't thought about doing virtual or, or an online simulations for cooking, but I think that is an excellent example of how to use simulations for training. Customer call center, I can't think of a better one. Sports training, that would actually be a, a really good way to use simulations, especially um, to try to help athletes train in certain ways to where they're not injuring themselves. Um, project management is another great one where those interactive spreadsheets come in, come in handy so you can see how resource management can be balanced. And troubleshooting, you guys already have a great sense for how and why simulations should be used. So thank you for participating in that. I'm going to go back to the presentation now um, to share with you just a few ways that I felt, um, some additional ways in which you guys already started to uh, respond, but a few additional ways that you might be able to use simulations. Um, building trust is in obviously the trust simulation and team building exercises for executives or for project teams that may not get um, that kind of uh, experience every day. Um, communication, which someone mentioned on the whiteboard, to provide a safe way for teammates or new management managers to experiment with different ways that they can communicate with each other. Um, technical training, a lot of you mentioned this, machine rebalancing, um, troubleshooting. It's a safe way to experiment with new materials or existing uh, equipment without the safety issues. Problem solving is a is the troubleshooting as well, but it's also a nice way to use a simulation because you can experiment with multiple methods of problem solving to help determine which one is the most effective for a given issue. And then process reengineering, which someone also mentioned. I want to say something special about um, process engineering and technical training. Simulations can really aid in change management because when people have to change the way they work, if they're going to if they must change the way that they perform um, every day, if they are practicing that, those new behaviors in a non-threatening way, they can become accustomed to the new process faster and easier instead of a baptism by fire approach, which may produce quite a bit of resistance. So now that we've talked about the different places and, and different skills and, and types of simulations that you can use in your environment. Let's talk about tips on facilitation. There are three steps to facilitating a successful simulation, and they are critical. The first step is to brief the simulation. So before the simulation, you can get people intrigued, interested, and excited about the simulation. Don't make it a test. Make it an experience. Uh, alert the participants about what to look for, you know, and what to pay attention to in the simulation, but try not to give away too many rules because you don't want to spoil any of the surprises that may come during the simulation. But you do want them to feel confident, excited, and comfortable beginning the simulation. So the, the briefing phase is all about having what I call the poker face. Now, during the coach, the coaching portion, which is actually during the simulation itself, Coach the participants, travel around the room, provide just-in-time information and just enough information, and try to coach quickly around the room so that you can, you can keep the energy and excitement up during the simulation and try not to let one group dominate too much of your time so you can make sure that you're spreading the energy across the room. In the last phase, which is the most important of all the three phases, after the simulation, Debrief the participant to ensure that they reflect on the experience, that they're able to draw those conclusions and create new ideas, um, make the relationship map in their mind, and truly gain the value that the simulation was meant, the business goal that the simulation was meant to meet. It's also a great idea 
when you're debriefing to debrief in a group so that each of the participants can share their ideas, that you can receive some peer learning, and that all of the participants uh, ha have been given a chance to um, talk about their different reactions to the experience because it will likely be that everyone in the room had a different experience and can learn from each other. The last part of the debriefing phase is to make sure that all the participants have an action plan. Why go through such a complex, delicate, special experience like a simulation without having an action plan on how to use those new skills, behaviors, and ideas that you um, created and that you came up with from the simulation? So action planning is, is the last of that debrief phase. So I'd like to do a little review. In the session today, we've talked about discovery and experiential learning, which is one of my favorite types of learning, And if you can't tell from my voice. <laughs> we've defined simulation. Um, we have listed characteristics, and hopefully you created that worksheet that will help you determine if a simulation is right for your environment, but also if that simulation is a quality simulation and will reach your business goals. We've cited examples of simple classroom and, and some more complex e-simulations. And then we've reviewed tips to successfully facilitate a simulation. One thing that I did mention that I wanted to when, when using the simulations, but I did talk about when we were talking about the debrief section of the uh, facilitation process, is that the key is that the simulation meet a business objective. So if you take anything from this seminar, I hope that it is that there are four characteristics to quality simulation, that there's a process to facilitating the simulation, but that the most important thing is that that simulation, that you've designed that simulation to meet a specific business objective, and that the people who go through it write their action plans that somehow connect to that business objective. So I'd like to take some questions, too. Feel free to type in any questions you may have about the session into the um, chat box. We'll be monitoring that. But while you're typing in those questions, I wanted to share a few resources with you. You can contact me to talk about the simulations um, that we have here at Lifecycle Institute or that we can build for you. Um, and you can contact me at eInstituteLC.com. I will receive those emails. I also have a blog that, frankly, I must be honest with you, over the holidays I did not post that many blog postings, but I will get back to it. You just see this week, check it on Friday. Uh, we also have the Lifecycle Institute website here listed. We have new services now. Um, Lifecycle Institute has primarily been a, an institute built on our training courses, our public classes and our private classes. And now we are offering course design services to where if you need to design classroom-based or online training and you need a, you need a special fit, we can provide those services for you, and we are also going to be launching our Train the Trainer services. So if you're interested in that, keep tabs on our website. I would really like to thank everyone for joining me today, and there is a short survey after the webinar. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me, and thanks again for joining the session.